You're listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, the weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht, Benjamin Pieske and Sam Gardner designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. Today I am talking with my good friend Stuart McGuire and we are talking about the book Never Splits the Difference, a really, really life-changing book. So stay tuned for that and now the music. Never Splits the Difference is a really, really interesting book. It is written by someone that has the experience of people that you usually only find in thrillers, action movies with Tom Hanks and whoever. But this is actually for real. So stay tuned for this really, really interesting episode. I'm producing this podcast in association with PSI, a community dedicated to leading and promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the video-on-demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars, and much, much more. Visit the PSI website at psiweb.org to learn more about PSI activities and become a PSI member today. Welcome to another book review with Stuart. Hi, Stuart. How are you doing? Hey, Alexander. Very well. Very well, indeed. Still in lockdown, though. <laughs> yeah, but today is bright blue sky outside so my mood is pretty good and it's <laughs> it's great that the kids can play outside that you know releases a little bit of the tension <laughs> well, we, if you have boys <laughs> we, we we have been told by the government um at this stage of lockdown that we may uh, be able to return to school in the coming weeks so there's lots of excitement amongst the parents of britain so uh, <laughs> yep Yeah, it's today, as we're recording it, is it's um, 23rd of February, and in Germany, schools just opened partially again, oh, but I right. predict they will close again before Easter. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really, really interesting that there's so many scientists that say, we need to be careful. The numbers go in the wrong direction. There's a pandemic within the pandemic with the new variations of the virus and yeah. they are more aggressive and they are more, you know, virulent. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, if you think that we are in lockdown and you see that the numbers are not declining anymore, but start to increase already, then you know that the third wave is already coming. Yeah, Still, all these scientists, all these epidemiologists and i think also the statisticians are not able to conv you know to convince the government mm -hmm. to act accordingly yeah and i think that is a that is one of these reasons one of these case studies where scientists you know fail on negotiating their their point they fail on convincing the others um and that actually leads very, very nicely to the books that we are talking about today. <laughs> it does, it does. And um, you have chosen another fantastic book, Alexander, Never Split the Difference, um, by the, uh, the chief negotiator, Chris Voss, is absolutely fantastic. It's one of these books that you just can't put down. Yeah. And you told me about this, I wasn't sure, I bought the book, And when I got into it, it's one of these ones that you literally tear through. So thank you again. <laughs> it, it's, it's one of the books that I also got recommended by my partner in crime, Gary Sullivan, <laughs> who I'm doing the leadership program together. And it's a book that really nicely complements the getting to yes that we already talked about. Yeah, I think if, if, you, if you think about getting to yes as a negotiator's guide for gentlemen, mm -hmm. then 
This is the book for the street smart people. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I've been thinking about this a lot. So um, I think Getting to Yes is a fantastic book which gives you a really good base layer of negotiation skills. Yeah. And I still, even though Never Split the Difference is very good, I would still recommend Getting to Yes because in a business sense and what I do in business development and in negotiating of contracts and working with outsourcing and contracts and um, proposal people is those technical skills of getting people together to agree, getting to yes is still an excellent, excellent um, uh, guide. Um, and that best alternative to a negotiated agreement yeah. Uh, that BATNA is, you know, life skills. And, and I know we're not talking about getting to yes, but I think as a starter, I would always suggest reading that before yeah. you then want to never split the difference. And um, I was talking to somebody quite senior in a pharmaceutical business yesterday, and he's read both books. And we agreed that never split the difference is exciting, it's dynamic, it's got you know, all the stories in it, whereas getting to US is very technical and specific and useful in, uh, in your everyday life. So, yeah, uh, you see that it's, you know, the authoring team is very different, whereas getting to yes is really from, you know, Harvard University, kind of this academic style, whereas mm -hmm. getting to yes is the author is a uh, someone that negotiated for the FBI, for the CAA, that needed to uh, convince people that are psychopaths. Yeah, so people that held hostages and, and things like that. It's not kind of, you know, where I think the Harvard people, they had more kind of, uh, yeah, kind of the US president talks to, you know, the Palestinian president and to the mm -hmm. Israeli president, you know, and you talk about, you know, peace and in that area. Yeah. Whereas I think Chris Voss is coming from, yeah, I need to fly now over to South America and free, you know, 10 US citizens. <laughs> um, and that's where the, you know, the title is coming from. Never splits the difference because you can't just say, oh, you kill five and I take five home. <laughs> And I think that, that that's really interesting because when you go through the book, he gives you lots of like little conclusions and things to work on. But what I took from Never Split the Difference, and, and it's kind of later in the chapter, is he really negotiates hard. Yep. He really there is there is, if you like, one winner, and he kind of lets uh, through empathy and other techniques. The person that he's talking off the ledge um, or who's about to, you know, um, uh, hold up a bank. He, he's talking to these people um, and he's really negotiating um, very hard, letting them feel that they're winning. Yeah. Um, and then there's another example where he goes in and um, negotiates the price of his car that he's about to buy. And he negotiates really hard and gets it for an amazing price that you kind of both of us would think, oh my, oh my goodness me, that's very impressive. What I've been thinking about in a business way, if you were to conduct every negotiation that hard, you would find it hard to have a business in this pharmaceutical industry because it, it would be it would be very difficult for people to enter into a negotiation with you, knowing. Um, yours that you know this sort of hard style so although I loved um, and I've taken down lots of points that hopefully we can unpick together it is quite um, it is quite hard um, yeah. and I think you know it, I always think there's different different things for different situations I don't want to dilute the message but I, I also take some of it with a little bit of a pinch of salt you know yeah yeah so. completely agree I um I was also looking into this, and if you if you are after long term relationships as well, yeah, yes. then maybe you know this one thing you you need to give 
Yeah, and, and you need to make sh also sure that the other person, you know, takes something from it. Because, you know, if you're, let's say, you're working with a supplier and you always kind of win, 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 yeah? At some point, the supplier will realize, well, there's no value in this, in this relationship. I really need to <laughs> get somewhere else here. <laughs> Or you completely ruin my business. So yeah, yeah, because yeah, uh, uh, I mean, going back to you know the car salesman. I mean, the car salesman he negotiated really hard with, and came away with an amazing deal, massive price discount. That car salesman, he'll be glad that he's made a sale, but the owners of the car company will not be able to continue on that level of margin. And soon they'll kind of think, oh, my goodness me, you know, if, if we get any more FBI negotiators coming in here to buy a car, we're going to be folding as a company. So um, <laughs> it, but the, the, there's a couple of things that I'm just going to unpick from the book. That yeah. Really yeah, let's go into a couple of the your recommendations, because I think yeah. the principles that he is recommending are really, really good. And you, you should be aware about them. Yeah. So what's, what's your couple of key takeaways? So a couple of big ones early on the book is slow down and really calm the conversation down and um, just take some time. Even when you think you're in like the most sort of hot situation, like he is negotiating with um, the bank robbers, just slow it and calm it down. And I think those words, particularly for, for somebody like me who, you know, like, likes, you know, very high throughput of, of, of work, you know, that sort of calming it down, slowing it down, actually sort of counter to how we normally operate. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was really good. And then this mirroring. So if the person you're speaking to has a sort of a certain style try to understand that style and reflect that. Now that's very tricky because I think that's an easy thing to get wrong, but I did like that sort of sense of slowing it down. And then I'm just gonna finish with this, um, this late night DJ voice that he talks about. So um, this sort of calming voice effect that he has. Um, and I guess that, you know, that, that, that was quite interesting as a technique. And then he goes into this sort of um, empathy, you know, really trying to understand, but it's tactical empathy and labeling things. Um, so you're really exposing um, the, the, the key points. And I, I like that a lot. And then um, I'm gonna jump forward a little bit. Um, big take home for me, was these calibrated questions that you can use in a negotiation, um, which normally start with a, a how. And I, I've started to use this um, recently is, you know, when somebody's asked me to do something that's impossible, you respond with, well, how am I supposed to do that? How, how, how am I supposed to do that? And asking questions that can't simply be answered by a yes or a no, but if you ask a, a how question, you can really uh, stimulate uh, a response. So those are just some of the early things I, I took. There's more, there's a lot more in there, um, but those are some of those early technique things that you, I, I took. Yeah, so this, this how technique is really, really interesting. So imagine someone comes to you and, and makes a request. Like, I need these analysis by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you basically ask back, can you help me how I should can make that possible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because usually our delivery uh, time frame is, you know, three or four days. How can I make that possible to be it in one day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that puts the onus back on the, on the requester. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very, very interesting and, and easy technique because it also makes, it shifts the problem from, oh, it's just my problem to it's our problem or your problem, actually. Yeah, because you want something. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's quite bold um, and it's, it's quite a tough one, particularly if your boss 
Um, there's a story in the book about a boss um, walking up to, I believe it's a, a, a secretary's desk and saying, I want a thousand photocopies by the end of tomorrow. And, you know, her normal sort of stance would be, yes, and then have to work through the night to get it done and be under a lot of pressure. Um, and as she's working with Chris Foss, she actually says, well, how am I supposed to do that? You know, that was like, you know, sort of pushing back. I'm paraphrasing now, but, you know, that's the sort of sentiment you get for, from this and being quite intelligent with your question back at how, you know, am I supposed to do this? It's quite confrontational. So I guess you've got to kind of be ready uh, for that. Uh, and then the boss goes away in this instant and, you know, it says, well, you know, maybe, maybe you don't need all the photocopies and, uh, and kind of lessens the, the request. But it does require an amount of being bold and being brave with these, with these techniques. Yeah, but it's also easier than to say no. Yeah, so it's yeah. this kind of not going directly into yes or no, but, you know, uh, trying to learn more about it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this is other question is, what about this is important to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, understanding more about the background. Yeah. I think that he also earlier in the book speaks about the active listening. Yeah. yeah. So to get more and more information from the other side, you need to be really, really good listener. And you need mm -hmm. to ask questions. And I think that is always something great in negotiations if you can learn more about the other side. Yeah, I think yeah. that is also uh, something that is in common with the getting to yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. The more you understand the other person or the other side, the better for you because mm -hmm. that's, you know, then you can use it and reframe things. You know? So for example, with this table delivery, okay, you asked me for 20 different tables. What's important for you? Uh, yeah, actually, I just need these two. The others can wait for, for another three weeks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm saying yes to your response. And in the book, it talks about don't be afraid of no. So if somebody does say no, that's kind of like the starter of the conversation, not the end of the conversation. And, um, you know, if, if, if I had like this urgent request where I needed, you know, some tables and listings and I said, you know, I want them done. And then the answer is no. Then the next question you go back with is, so, well, well, when or, you know, what can we do? You know, then you kind of enter in to this sort of discussion. But people use no as a sort of a, a comfort blanket And they're saying no because they're being taken out of their comfort zone. They didn't believe they're able to do something. So they say no. And often people go, okay, they said no. And I'll go back to their boss and they said, well, I asked them and they said no. <laughs> and actually what this book talks about is don't be afraid of no. In fact, that's the start. It's not a failure. That's the place where you start your negotiation. And then... Um, I think you, were, you, you may be aware that um, I've come from a, a background where I've done a lot of cold calling in my time. And you have like these sorts of um, uh, guides and tips. Some people have scripts, but in my, my, my time, it's always been like, you know, things that I've wanted to say. And you phone somebody up and they just say no. And you're like, huh, you know, you really feel, you know, uh, wounded. And then the, the technique is, overcoming objections and overcoming boundaries and you're sort of schooled in you know what your next response is but actually when you think about it no is an obvious thing and you just phone somebody up they're not going to agree to something over the telephone you'd be foolish if they did so that no has to be um uh you know sort of taken as the start of the negotiation not the end um, which I thought was, I thought was absolutely fantastic. Really, the other, the other part in it, if you get a no from the other side, that's actually a good thing, yeah. Because um, the more often they say no, the harder it becomes to say no. So that's an interesting psychological thing, yeah. That's also some of these, 
yeah, let's say more kind of street smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Psychological games that you can play. Yeah, so it's it's not necessarily that you know no is di directly a, a bad thing, especially if you made you know quite a bold request. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the um, in the book um, he he wants to get into negotiating, so he goes to I don't know negotiation school and he says, you know, I want I want to build a team, and they say no, and then he's like, well, oh, come on, then what do I need to do? And um, I guess she said, go and work on like one of these sort of Samaritan helplines, go work on one of those um, you know call centers to help people. And then he got the bit of information he needed to understand his next step in his career. Mm -hmm. So having the no then opened the how question. And I think that's, um, you know, that calming it down, looking at a sort of a longer trajectory of getting everything you need from an instantaneous call, you know, is, uh, you know, is a really good technique. Another kind of these street smart techniques is bending their reality. It's kind of that is I think probably if you, if you if you read this, watch out for these things when you go to your <laughs> car sale, uh, salesman because yeah. that is I think these are very very often used kind of mm -hmm. anchoring their emotions. So so you know or uh, let's see other person go first yeah you see that very often in salary discussions what's what's your current salary yeah mm. it's and then you know uh that's already kind of you know that's saying sets an anchor or you can you know set a range or and, and things like that so so there's there's always these you know psychological things and that's where when i read this i was reminded of daniel kahneman's book yeah of all these kind of biases that we have and the, mm. um, slow and, and fast thinking and these kind of bending the reality speaks really to this fast thinking yeah? mm. so where we automatically you know respond to something without really logically thinking about it yeah it yeah. becomes then kind of so the, the norms, the standards, the anchors. And so that's, these are also really, really interesting uh, topics. Yeah, I think the um, anchoring in a negotiation, um, there's that um, empathy that you're trying to use. And I thought that there was a, a part in the book about the, the, these, these kidnappers mm -hmm. and they are requesting huge sums of money huge sums of money and what he's trying to get at is well actually is it this huge sum of money that they're going to you know retire on for the rest of their life that they're after or is it um you know a really fun weekend that they want to uh they want to basically be able to to, to, to have the money to spend on and it's which I, mean, I thought was fascinating. I think all of us, when we think of sort of kidnapping, it's like the worst place you can go to in terms of um, uh, sort of a negotiation. But he's there thinking, well, what is it that they really want here? You know, what what is it that they're um, that they're sort of truly after? So I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, that was an interesting story. I remember that as well, where you know, there's, there's this kind kind of environment where. Um, the hostages are held where it's kind of a, a sport of certain local uh, people to kidnap someone so that they have enough money for the next big party <laughs> weekend. <laughs> <And> get drunk. <laughs> no, crazy. Absolutely. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. Awesome. But it's that is really an interesting part. Let's double click a little bit on the empathy side because yeah. I think this is really important in all relationships yeah if mm -hmm. you are uh, independent of whether you're in a negotiation or whether you just have a usual kind of business discussion that is not even a, a negotiation i think showing empathy 
and feeling, you know, reflecting on the feelings that the other person has, yeah, um, verbalize them, yeah, not just, you know, uh, see, uh, notice them, but verbalize them, yeah, mm -hmm. see kind of, oh, you, you look pretty, pretty busy and hectic at the moment, yeah, or mm -hmm. you see, uh, uh, you know, is something wrong? Yeah, you 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 look tired or something like this. Yeah, or um, oh, looks like you feel really good today. Yeah, mm -hmm. that really helps quite a lot to build a relationship, and that you know to build trust because and trust is really really important for all these negotiations. Yeah, because mm -hmm. if there's no trust, then there's no no really good agreement in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I think in the book he talks about uh, understanding who you're talking to. And I think he labels, is it the assertive, the analyst, and the accommodator, and the different types of people that you typically speak with. And a long silence from somebody might be, you know, if you're an assertive person like I am, um, when you get a long silence, you're thinking, oh, why are they not getting this? Why are they not moving? Whereas if you're an analyst, you know, you're just thinking, actually, I need to just, I need to think about this. I, I really need to consider the whole thing before I just shoot back a response. And I'm not just going to give a response. I'm going to give you some silence. And that can be quite frustrating for different types of people coming together so understanding those uh, and understanding the type of person so we we talked um, a, a previous book um uh, the chimp paradox mm -hmm. um which i still think of as one of the most amazing books i've read this year in um and the, the sort of the different parts of the brain and you've got this reactive uh fight fight, fight or flight um parts of, of your brain and you know, when people are communicating with each other, on what levels are they communicating? So when you sort of unpick that empathy piece, actually just think, oh, you know, this isn't just about me. This person needs to get what they want out of this as well and really start to find common landing areas, spaces to, 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 to speak on. Yeah. Yeah. So if you haven't listened to the podcast about the chimp paradox, <laughs> just scroll a little bit back in your podcast player and, and search for that. And the one about getting to yes is even <laughs> even earlier in our in our series. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, some other learnings. So what is, you know, some other takeaways that you have from the book? I think Actually, this one's um, hard to um, articulate, but it's um, the difference between listening and hearing. So somebody can talk and you can just, you know, listen to them and they're just talking and talking and you're kind of listening and thinking that you're um, processing it. But if you're hearing them, there's certain things in what they are saying that you start to understand about the person, about what they are looking to achieve, about what they really want, their desires, what is their real fundamental goals. And sometimes they're signaling them and telling you them in a very indirect way. So that hearing piece, understanding where somebody's come from, how they've been raised, what they're... Um, religion is, what their um, belief systems are, what their anchors are, um, and really starting to actually hear those subtleties and then use those to fully understand. Um, uh, we're going back to the empathy again, I know, but it, it's, more, it's more subtle and it's more, um, it, it's actually really... Um, difficult. <laughs> it's not an easy thing, um, particularly yeah. fast-moving text and uh, email and um, you know voice clip environment that we're living in at the moment. But to really hear what somebody is saying, as opposed to just listening. 
Um, so that that I have been thinking about a lot. Yep, yep. So it's an awesome book. It's really entertaining. Yeah, it has lots of great stories in it. And as you can imagine, these kind of stories with hostages also sometimes go south. Yeah, so there's also he learns from all these failures and, you know, why is he... You know, why the FBI actually is failing instead of, a, you know, even if they apply all these things and, you know, he's learning through experience. And so it's really a great book to read. It's fun to read. It's actually, you know, not that super long book. Yeah. Um, and so I can only highly recommend it because you want to probably read it, you know, again and again to learn about all these different tips and tricks in it. Because there's very often, you know, a couple of different things like, you know, these calibrating questions. He has a, has a list of different things or these uh, bending the realities. There's a, there's a number of different ways you can do it. So um, also good if you just go into maybe your next salary negotiation or things like that, yeah? Um, have it there and take it from there. Any final word, Stuart? Well, I think um, we will talk, I'm sure, about the black swan uh, oh, yeah. in the future. Uh, I think for me, this idea of, you know, <laughs> I don't want to spoil the book too much because, you know, it's really worth reading. But I think the black swan as a topic um, is, is absolutely fascinating. You know, nobody ever believed that there was going to be a black swan. It was just, you know, and then was, I think it was Australia, somebody uh, came across uh, a black swan. And that is an analogy for, um, you know, as we were planning for business two years ago and you're looking and seeing, well, what can go wrong? What can happen? Nobody thought a global pandemic would be you know, <laughs> such a, a strain uh, uh, across across the industry, or um, such, such a, a difficult scenario for, for people's livelihoods. So that, for me, is a black swan. Just you know, just comes out, and then actually you can say, well, it's not a black swan. We've had um, pandemics in the past. We were very due one. Um, it wasn't that long ago in our history, in our global history, that we've had um, these issues in the past. So actually, why do we think it's so unusual? And people who live in, you know, uh, live next to black swans probably think, why do people think this is so unusual? You know, maybe a white swan is unusual. So, yeah, it's that sort of changing the mindset, I think, is a topic that maybe we can, uh, uh, we can pick into in the future. Yep, yep. Very good. So keep on listening and uh, check out the show notes for all the comments that we made and, and some further resources. This show was created in association with PSI. Thanks to Rain, who helps with the show in the background. And thank you for listening. Head over to theeffectivestatistician.com where you will find the show notes, the link to the book, and lots of other stuff that helps you to boost your career as a statistician in the health sector. Reach your potential, lead great science, and serve patients. Just be an effective statistician. Music